you for coming to the North Reading Candidate Forum, sponsored by the North Reading Transcript and broadcast by NORCAM. I am Bob Toraz, former editor of the Transcript. I worked from the paper from 1977 to 2016, and I am serving as your moderator tonight. We are hopeful that the next 90 minutes will be helpful to all voters going to the polls in the town election on Tuesday, May 3rd. This forum came about when a group of local parents noticed that their high school age children were expressing a great deal of interest in the upcoming election. What an inspiring and laudable thing to have our youngest voters so engaged. In an effort to support the interest of these young adults, to show them civic engagement and that their voices mattered, the parents approached the transcript. Together, they designed this forum in which First, we will be introduced to some of the candidates running unopposed on the May 3rd ballot. Then, in the contested race for two open slots on the school committee, three students representing our engaged young voters will pose questions to the five candidates. To an email address provided for this purpose, the general public has been invited to submit questions via the transcript and social media over the last couple of weeks. Additionally, the students reached out to their classmates to receive questions. The dozens of questions received were grouped into theme and subject areas to create the questions the candidates will hear tonight for the first time. Let's meet our student questioners. My name is Wesley Fisher and I am a senior at North Reading High School. Hi, I'm Shivi Shrikanth and I'm a senior at North Reading High School as well. My name is Lily Joyce, and I'm also a senior at North Reading High School. Good for the class of 2022. Thanks to each of you for your interest in this election and for being here tonight. Before we turn to the candidates for, for uncontested seats, if you want to check to see if you are eligible to vote in the May 3rd election, you are in luck. The registration deadline is tonight by midnight. <laughs> Scan the QR code on your screen and it will link you to the site where you can be sure that you are registered. If you are not registered, you can do so by midnight tonight. A quick word to those at home with us tonight are the candidates, one family member, they may have, oh, excuse me. With us tonight are the candidates, comma, one family member they may have invited for support, members of the forum volunteer team, in the transcript and NORCAM staff. The audience here is reminded that they are not to be an audible or visual distraction during this event. We will begin by hearing from some of those incumbents running for uncontested seats in the town election. We've invited them to give two minute introductions to let us know who they are and what they value about public service. Neil. My name is David Redloff. I am seeking a second term on the Community Planning Commission. The other night when I was writing the statement, my nine-year-old daughter asked me what I was doing. I told her, and she said, tell them you missed a lot of dinners. <laughs> so with credit given to my daughter, that one goes out to all, the, all of you that serve the many committees, boards, and councils, and I include the town employees that attend these meetings in the evening after working a full day in NORCAM. Um, I have lived in North Reading for 13 years. My wife and I grew up in North Reading, and together we have raised two daughters, ages 9 and 11. We are raising two daughters at 9 and 11. I have owned a design and construction management consulting firm since uh, 2006. I have over 30 years of experience managing a wide range of projects from hotels, <coughs> golf clubs, residential, retail, commercial office, manufacturing, warehouse, and distribution. Three years ago, I wrote my first statement like this. I had never served on a public board or commission. I was not versed in parliamentary rule, still not, uh, even though I have stood across these types of commissions for years representing clients. I just knew that I wanted to get involved and use what I know from my experiences to help. The CPC seemed like a good fit for me. Almost three years in, I'm happy to report that I have enjoyed this experience serving you. During my first term, the CPC was successful in rezoning a portion of Park Street local business area to include a new senior housing overlay district, which allowed for 50 new housing units. 
We have also been engaged in an ongoing design and advocacy effort to reimagine and create a new town center, something that many residents surveyed say is missing here. The prospect of finally getting municipal sewer on Main Street is exciting and holds promise to open doors that have remained out of reach or not feasible with private septic systems. Whether or not sewer happens, I look forward to work to the work to ensure that our zoning along this vital corridor aligns with your vision of what you want our Main Street to look like. There's obviously much to do. If you have not already done so, I encourage all of you to consider serving our great town in some form. Attending any of the many public meetings is just one way. We want to hear your voice. If elected to a second term, I look forward to seeing you all at one of our meetings. Thank you for your time. Hi there. I'd like to just follow that by saying ditto, but that's not going to work. My, my name's Sherry Greer, and I graduated from this high school 38 years ago, and I've been here for 50 years of my life. I have, my kids have graduated from North Reading, and I have had the honor of serving for the town of North Reading for the last 11 years. I've worked originally at the police department, then I moved over to the town hall and worked at the town clerks. Then I moved to the assessor's office and I worked as the, in the assessor's office. And my most recent move was five years ago over to the senior center. So I'm the administrative assistant at the senior center. I pulled nomination papers for the housing authority because the seat was empty. And I couldn't believe nobody volunteered. Housing means a lot to me and knowing the seniors in this town the way I do know them and have grown up with them here, it's a big issue. I'm really glad to finally meet David because I know he's part of this journey as well. So I pulled the seat for a, a position I really don't know a lot about. I just know that I needed to be there. I've been a realtor for over 20 years in this town and uh, it's something that I have a passion about is where housing is gonna go in the future for North Reading. I don't have much more prepared than that, I'm sorry, but it was the reason I'm here. Thank you. Okay, uh, good evening everyone, and thank you for inviting me to your candidate forum tonight. My name is Rich Walner, and I am running for my second term on the select board. Although my seat is uncontested, I still appreciate the opportunity to share a few thoughts about my goals for the next three years. I am running for the select board because the board, along with the town administrator, have found satisfying and productive ways to work together for the good of the town, and second, because I want to continue to bring forward and work on ideas that will improve the quality of lives for everyone in our town. That being said, I see trouble ahead. For example, our demographics are changing rapidly. We are one of the fastest growing communities of seniors in Massachusetts, yet our seniors are slowly being pushed out from our town due to high property taxes lack of services, and lack of age-appropriate community gathering places. Why is it important to keep our seniors in town? Here is one fiscal reason. It takes the property taxes from two empty nester homes to support the cost of sending just one child to our schools. To support our schools, we need a healthy number of empty nesters to support our schools. But here is an even more alarming statistic. When our kids go to schools, we as the parents are really connected to our community. But when the kids move on, we begin to ask ourselves, is there life after kids? Which is quickly followed by, do I stay or do I go? This is the question that the so-called rising senior parents asked during graduation ceremonies at the high school. Unfortunately, recent studies show that only 60% of our rising senior parents intend to stay. This is an alarming stat because the state average is 60%, 80%. This is a leading indicator that we must take active steps now to give these rising seniors reasons to stay in their home and our town, or we risk decimating our schools and our community in 10 to 15 years if they leave. The select board understands this concern and has already decided to fill a long vacant role of public services director to help lead the way, but there is so much more to do. Meanwhile, I am not a single issue candidate. I support recreational projects such as improving access to the Swan Pond area, improving Martin's Pond, and most recently proposing a recreational trail that will connect Ipswich River Park to Willis Woods and Linfield and the bike trails throughout North Shore. I support social causes such as working with the Council of Aging, Commission on Disabilities and the Tax Aid Committee, and I also strongly support the need for diverse, diversity education in our schools because our kids want and need to be prepared for a world of many colors, as we all saw so wonderfully expressed by our students in the transcript. 
As a parting thought, remember, communities are not built on, transact on a transactional basis or under threat, but through polite and respectful exchange of ideas, compromise, and long-term relationship building. That is a community I want to contribute to and live in for life. Your vote for me will be an indicator that you feel the same way. Thank you. Yes, my name is Warren Pierce. I'm a lifelong resident of North Reading, other than the time I've, uh, I spent in the military. And um, I have uh, 30 years on the planning board now. And, um, but I'm running for another term because as you've heard from the other candidates, there's still a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of things we need to uh, address a lot, and, and the planning board has the ability to address a lot of those. So um, we look for, I look forward to continuing that work as we go through the ne these uh, next few years. The elderly housing, uh, all of the things that got mentioned, all of those things are, are things that we can work on at the planning board and have in fact been working on them. So um, one of the things about a, a vote for an uncontested candidate is it indicates whether or not your approval of the job they're doing. So, so while asking for a vote, I want you to do it to tell me if you think we're doing a good job, not just myself, but any of the other members, and it will help us make decisions as we move forward. So I thank you all very much. I thank Bob for coming here tonight and being our Master of Ceremonies and Rachel, as well as the North Reading Transcript for sponsoring this. I think it's a great idea. And I look forward to hearing what the kids have for questions. <laughs> Me too. Thank you. Thanks to each of you for being here tonight and in introducing yourselves to the voters. <clears throat> we appreciate the countless hours and care you put into serving our community. Thanks for running again. And now to the five candidates running for the two open seats on the school committee. We've invited each candidate to make an opening statement of one minute. After they make their statement, they may take their seats from the leftmost chair to the right. The order for opening statements will be determined by drawing names. And who will go first? John Barrett. Um, real quick clarification, though. The uh, invite I got said two minutes of the mistake. That's correct. Chinese. Oh, he said one minute. Oh, sorry about that. That's my mistake. That's right. So I sit anywhere? Um, left to right, please. On the left. Should I start? Okay. Hi, I'm John Barrett. I grew up in a family of seven in an 1800 square foot house with four tiny bedrooms and two bathrooms. In 1980, my dad made $13,000, which today would be about 45,000, so not a lot. We didn't have much, but we had God and we had family. Our rusty station wagon was our only car, and my sister and I would drop raisins and peanuts through the holes in the floor as we watched the pavement race by. In high school, I was a farm laborer, picking corn, pumpkins, apples, and peaches for about $2 an hour to make a few extra dollars. John Cougar Mellencamp's anthem, Jack and Diane, paints a very good picture of my youth. As a college student, I ate pellet, pallets full of 25 cent ramen. I was poor. And I missed seeing the blues legend Stevie Ray Vaughan because I didn't have $8 to, to pay for a ticket. In 1990, as a second lieutenant in the Air Force, I was making $14,000, which is the equivalent today of minimum wage at McDonald's. And I had a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering and a Master's in Physics from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. So minimum wage job. I was recently informed by a resident who should have known better that I was the beneficiary of white privilege. And it, this was at a, a town meeting. I have a plea to, uh, to the children of North Reading. Reject the divisive political dogma that is brainwashing you to believe that America is a bad country, that racism is systemic, that you were born a victim or an oppressor. And, the, and a bunch of other lies. Go to YouTube, 
and watch Bono from the, stand, from the band U2 describe America as an idea. The great melting pot, the land of opportunity, where anyone can achieve anything they set their mind to. Do not let the school and the media gaslight you into believing that you are a victim and that the American dream is out of reach. One more sentence. Listen to 80s music and watch 80s movies. These represent the carefree high school life that you deserve. Turn to God and family and reject the stressful social justice indoctrination and identity politics that the schools are pumping into you. To quote the Beastie Boys, you gotta fight for your right to party. Thank you. Can I stay here? The 80s reference is good. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jeff Friedman. Uh, I'm, I'm a father of a, of a third grader. Uh, my wife is a clinical social worker at a, at a local school system. And I'm an attorney who's got roughly 20 years of experience managing complex and, and very difficult projects in my career. But I want to take a step back and talk about what is the role of school committee? What is it that we're, we're trying to do for this town. Uh, two nights ago, the school committee was discussing many things, um, the, the least exciting of which was the $36 million budget that they actually manage to run the schools, 83% or so of which go to our educators. Um, if we want to attract the best teachers and keep the best teachers here, that should be our focus in my opinion. Um, we need to focus on making sure we have competitive pay, and we do. We, we have actually done a great job of increasing pay in the, last, uh, in the last negotiation cycle. And we need to give them the resources they need and, quite frankly, get out of their way. So in the spirit of understanding what the job is, what, it is, what is it not? Well, for me, what it is not is getting involved in classroom curriculum. For me, it is not about talking about what books should or should not be in the classroom. If we're gonna stay true to, to being good managers, good stewards of our schools, we surround ourselves with great teachers, with great people, and let them do their jobs. My experience in managing, if it's taught me nothing else, it's surround yourself with people that are smarter than you and let them do their jobs. As responsible school managers, what do we oversee? We oversee schools, uh, kids and their after school programs in terms of getting them their buses that they need, making sure that's funded. Whether or not kindergarten could be reduced in cost for kids, for, uh, for parents who need it. Making sure we have the right adjustment counselors. If, if you saw the, the committee meeting, we, we've got to make tough decisions about who can and cannot be hired because of the budget. Um, so. Let me just say, we, whoever is elected here will be negotiating the next contracts for our teachers. Um, that to me is the heart of the job and that to me is what our kids need to have pride in that we're doing a good job of. Thank you. Um, first, I want to say thank you to everyone who put this forum together, as well as the residents of North Reading who submitted questions and are listening online at home. The event is a perfect example of what being a member on the school committee is all about, listening to our community members, answering questions, and being a resource for others. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Kristen O'Mara, and I am running for school committee. My why is for all of our children, and I strongly believe education is one of our most important community investments. I graduated from UMass Dartmouth with a bachelor's degree in human resource management and finance. I will bring a new unique perspective and offer a variety of problem solving strategies to this committee with my leadership and financial skill sets from my past experience as a bank manager. My husband and I moved to North Reading 10 years ago because we wanted to be a part of a town that had a highly ranked school system, 
knowing we would grow our own family here. I'm the mother of two boys who attend the Little and Hood Elementary Schools. Thank you. Um, I want to start by obviously thanking everyone as well. Um, my name is Jody Cloney. Um, I bought my house in North Reading about 15 years ago, and my parents bought their house here about 20 years before that. I have a son that is a freshman in high school and a daughter who's in the eighth grade. I am running because I'm exhausted, and I don't think I'm the only one. We should all be working together to protect the most vulnerable, but that isn't always enough. We also need to be willing to stand up to those responsible for harming others and hold them accountable. That is what it is to be an ally. I'm asking you to vote for me so I can be an ally to all the exhausted folks like me that need one. Come on down. a long walk. Um, good evening, everyone. I just want to say a quick thank you to the organizers of the event and the kids that are here and NORCAM as well. Thank you so much for pulling this together. It's a great opportunity. Um, so hello to everyone out there in Hornet land. Um, I know you're watching. Um, I'm happy to have this time to introduce myself to those residents that I may not know yet. My name is Noelle Rudloff, and I'm a proud mother of two little girls at the Bachelor School. I have a fifth grader, Arden, who will be moving on to the middle school next year, and a third grader, Dorothy. I also happen to be a product of the school system, as I grew up in North Reading and attended the Batch, the middle school, and the high school. North Reading was a wonderful place to grow up and launch from. I went on to college and graduate school in Boston and then worked for many years in public health and health education research on a variety of projects in geriatrics, mental health, and women's health. When it came time to settle down and raise a family, my husband and I returned to North Reading to let my deep roots grow even deeper. Once a hornet, always a hornet. Our family places great value on civic and um, involvement and community volunteering, and I have always served as a volunteer in one way or another uh, for the schools or the community at large. Um, and thus, I was inspired to run for school committee because I wanted to take my involvement to the next level. And I understand the importance of maintaining the integrity and high standards of our school committee in this day and age. I also feel strongly that we need to move past the noise that seems to be clouding the conversation and focus on continuing to foster strong academic environment, a welcoming and diverse school community, and to support teachers and administration, all while listening to the concerns of family and the community. Thank you. Thank you all for that. Now that you have taken your seats, I will describe how the forum will proceed. Together with Maureen Doherty, students have developed a list of questions der derived from dozens of questions that came in from the community. Because many of the questions covered similar topics, they have been combined and reworked to capture the essence of the issues conveyed. None of you have seen this list of questions in advance. Issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion are at the front of the public's mind as indicated by the questions we received. We will deal with these issues in this forum, but we'll also focus on the day-to-day -day primary responsibility of the school committee, including budgeting, contract negotiations, and maintaining a strong administration. Candidates. The ground rules for this forum are as follows. The order of responses to a question will be determined by drawing names out of a hat. 
This is to prevent anyone from getting a fear, unfair advantage if we just go up and down the line time after time. When it is your turn, you will have two minutes to respond to each question. You are not to interrupt the person speaking. When you have 30 seconds left, you will see a yellow card. When you have 10 seconds left, you will see a red card. When your time is over, time will be called. We ask you to model to our young voters the best of civic discourse and decorum. I will help you to stay on track. You ready to begin? Sure. Yes. What is the most pressing issue or concern right now for the school committee, and how can you support the school system in tackling this issue? Thanks. Um, as I've, um, I think that North Reading does a number of things really well. I think that we have some great programs. We have amazing academics. Um, but I think that the things that we don't do well are the things that are most pressing in this time. Um, I think that right now there is a large percentage of the students that are accessing amazing, wonderful, great programs, but there are some that aren't able to access them, um, whether that be for financial reasons or because of different marginalized communities that they're members of. I think that we're not serving our community until the, the kids who need the most help are getting that help, right? So I can, Notorious is a great example. They are, you know, the top 10 in the entire state. That's amazing. We, I want them to keep striving to be better, but also if there are kids who can't participate and go to New York because they don't have the financial resources or kids who don't have the resources to get private singing lessons or those kinds of things, that's, it doesn't matter how much better we make Notorious, some kids are gonna be left out. So right now I think the most pressing thing that is facing our school system is making sure that everyone has access to all the amazing things that we're already offering. Sorry, I, do I have more time? <laughs> okay. No, I'm good, I'm good. Sure. Uh, it, to me the most pressing issue slash issues really deal with uh, the budget gaps. Up until recently, there was roughly a $1.5 million budget gap for, for our school system. That translates not just into geekish numbers that I like to get into, it really directly impacts our students. You know, can we actually hire the additional adjustment counselor that we want? There are tough choices that have to be made when you start looking at those budgetary issues that, that really have day-to-day -day impact. There are a number of open positions, uh, adjustment counselor being one of them, but you even get into programs like what Jody was talking about. Do we have the funding to actually make the, the, uh, make the opportunities available for everybody, whether it's an after-school program, whether it's an educational program? If we want to talk about uh, what opportunities are, it takes money. And having a budgetary gap means hard decisions have to be made. So I, I think our school committee has done a great job filling it. Uh, they cut it down to 400,000 or cutting it down from there uh, and they do that in collaboration with not just themselves but with other committees around town. So if you want my opinion about what the primary issues are, the money in the town, ultimately everything else revolves around it and making sure that this committee is, is on top of that and working collaboratively throughout the town to solve it, to me that's, that's the most important issue. Hello, um, I represent many, many parents um, in town, so I'm not alone. Um, I'm the one that has been chosen to, to uh, try to fight this fight. Uh, I, th I believe the no most pressing issue in the school is that the school's singular role is to teach STEM, languages, arts, and civics with a little blend of gym and health back to the 80s. That's what schools used to be. The school, in, in the opinion of many, is spending an inordinate, inordinate amount of time on divisive topics such as critical race theory, comprehensive sex education down to K through five, so social emotional learning. These are not the role of the public school system. 
these dictates are being passed down from an unelected and unaccountable official named Jeffrey C. Riley of Desi. And the issue is at heart, at hand, is the following. Any and all parent objection to this divisive, critical race theory and all these other theories that they're pumping into your head has been thoroughly rejected by the school committee and by the town, has been thoroughly ignored. There is a public law, 20 U.S. Code 1532H. Parents have the legal right to transparency, choice, and consent regarding school curriculum. That law is being violated. We do not have transparency in the library. We just took a picture of the library. It says, this is restricted access by order of the um, superintendent. We want access to the libraries so we can see what kind of perverted books are in there that are 16 and over. The books on the, on the windowsill out by the library should not be accessible by second graders playing basketball on Saturday in the gym. We want consent and we want choice in the curriculum by the public law, and we're not getting it, and that's why I'm here. Thank you. Any chance you could repeat that question? What is the most pressing issue or concern right now for the school committee, and how can you support the school system in tackling this issue? Thank you. Um, so I would say I think the pandemic's impacts over the past um, you know, two years is um, I think we're doing a great job trying to move forward from it. I do think there's learning gaps um, all throughout all five schools. I think there's mental health that needs to be addressed with that as well. Um, that you know plays into the budget with, um, as Jeff was mentioning, we do have, you know, we have to make up for more positions, um, so that plays a role. I also think, um, you know, just in a whole, like all the departments, we, we, we had a great school going. The pandemic hit, we kind of were frozen in time. Um, then we were doing remote learning, and now we're back. Um, and I think we just really need to do a good review of, of everything, of the staff that we have in play, of um, people that are on medical leaves, making sure all of our children are having a plan, you know, for them. I know um, we can't be perfect, obviously, but I think we really need to dive in to look at our staffing um, and looking at where, where the learning gaps are, where budget needs to play into that for who we're hiring, extra that we're hiring, um, and making sure we're holding people accountable making sure that our staff's being held accountable, our kids are being held accountable, um, you know, to, to make our school district as great as it can be. Um, I think we do have a great staff and I think we can really pull together. I think we just need to look, dive into that a little bit more. Thank you. Do I have like a weighted? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not complaining. <laughs> Um, okay, so the most pressing issue f uh, facing the school committee, um, I'm going to piggyback on what Kristen said. I think um, we have been in crisis mode for the last two years um, in, related to the COVID pandemic, but also just it's been a tough few years for everyone, um, students most of all. Um, so I think that is the most important issue right now, um, moving on from from COVID going on to really establish the, um, that common culture of unity that the schools can thrive on. Um, the, um, and I think that can be done through um, efforts to, that, that, that the school committee is involved with to uh, fund student activities. Getting back to normal, I heard the other night on school committee that the kids are going on their first trip again. and. Jody mentioned notorious. Nothing pulls a community be uh, together better than than a common uh, passion for the arts. So, like, let's get back to that, um, and also um, continuing to support teachers um, and give them the resources that they need um, as kids catch up academically from the losses of COVID. Um, there are challenges, I'm sure, at every unique level. Um, of the schools, um, so recover academically and emotionally. Thank you. Um, noting that one of the primary responsibilities of the school committee is to guide budget decisions, what changes, if any, would you make to the budget priorities, for example, activity fees, bus fees, kindergarten fees, athletic fees, 
or special education services, including out-of-district placements. Again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, that's totally fine. Um, so um, starting, that was a lot of questions, <laughs> like a lot of pieces. So I think starting with the budget, um, I, I do have a lot of experience working on large budgets and making those complicated decisions that come with having limited funding. I think that how I would want to approach the budget is, and I think this is when I was talking about diversity uh, and inclusion and equity, like what we sort of are prioritizing is very much reflected in that budget, right? I think that um, the fees in North Reading, there are just so many of them. And for lots of families or some families, those fees are not of no consequence to them whatsoever. Um, but there are families who have multiple children, who want to do multiple things, that have to make hard choices. And I think that, you know, one of the things that I would like to do um, right away is to make it a much easier process to request um, some sort of assistance on those. Right now, there's no, if you get the notice from the athletic department that you owe them $400 for your kid to play a single sport, there's nothing in there that says, if this creates a hardship and you want to participate, click this button, right? We don't give people an option to maintain their respect and dignity and still participate. And I think that if we find a way to, I'd love to see all fees go away. I probably won't be able to do that right away. Um, but what we can do is make it so that, let's see what happens when we treat people. Like again, you know, if you're, something happens to your laptop and you need to come up with, um, you know, $75 right away for every family that isn't something that they can just do without having to think about it or plan for it. So I think that's how I want to approach the budget is how can we make it more equitable for people to access all of the services. There you go. <laughs> um, okay, so for this question, I would say um, I would, I, I, I wouldn't say anything right now I would rework or change because I think what I need to do would be to learn by plunging into the fray, if you will. Um, and begin by talking to some of the stakeholders that I haven't really had a, an opportunity to talk to yet um, in terms of, I plunged into this race not too long ago. Um, I would like to hear from teachers. I would like to hear from the different levels of administration. Um, where do they see needs? Where do they see things that are not getting funded? Where do they see overspending? Um, and again, when I say talking to stakeholders, that also um, includes parents. So, for example, Jody's concern about user fees, I haven't gotten to that point yet where I have user fees for my children, and I see that as, a, like, that's such a great point. They, you know, kids need to be able to afford whatever activity that's going to enrich their lives. So by talking to different stakeholders, parents like Jody, teachers, um, people involved in technology, I think I would learn a lot more and be able to answer that question a lot better in three years when I'm up for re-election. <laughs> uh, it's a great question, thank you. Um, when thinking about what priorities uh, require funding and require uh, assistance in any limited budget situation where you're not going to get more resources. There's no magic fund sitting out there with a, a million dollar slush fund saying, hey, now everybody's funded. Uh, there are a couple of things. And, and Noel did a good job of saying you really have to take input to understand what are the requirements. But the other, other piece of it to me is there's a lens of inclusion. What are the priorities that actually allow for the greatest inclusion within the town? So if there's a, a strict choice between two things and you can only fund one of them, it's a binary option, you look to see what does the greatest good. It's sort of a, a cost benefit type of thing. Um, you look to see how many kids or, or what the benefit is of each, and you make your determination that way. They're not always easy or friendly or great choices. Sometimes there's only so much creativity that can go into these sorts of prioritization decisions. Um, sometimes they are tough decisions. Other times, 
not as much. Sometimes it really does mean, okay, there's a little bit for everybody and we just have to make do. Uh, and yes, I, I even remember when I was a kid, uh, which is a long time ago, uh, having to, uh, that our family had to pay fees for activities too. Um, we want that to be as limited as possible, but not at the cost of limiting the number of choices our kids have. As a, as a kid who, as a, as a parent of a, of a child who wants to skate and swim and sing and be a part of, uh, of just about everything she can get her hands on, I want to make sure she has opportunity to do whatever she wants, even though it may cost a little bit more. Um, I'm not saying there's a means test or anything along those lines, but I, I do think that activity f fees are going to be a fact of life, but you do have to make tough decisions. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay, so for the budget, um, you know, it's a big, it's $36 million. It's a lot of money out there. Um, and I know there's part of it's, you know, from the taxes and part of it's um, from the state aid. Um, I think we have to do a balance, kind of like what Jeff was saying. We need the challenge is to balance everything. We want to have small class sizes across five schools. We want to keep our teachers in their contracts, offer a variety of electives um, at the high school level, um, you know, digital learning, entrepreneurship, all sorts of different types of world languages. These are all, you know, not offered everywhere. Um, so that takes a piece of the budget um, in what we're paying for. I definitely think, you know, recommending decreasing some fees like the, the kindergarten tuition, um, if we could scale back, you know, 500 over a course of a couple of years, um, that would, I think, be much easier to attain than to just waive the fee completely. Um, same with the sports, it's a new thing too I wasn't aware of yet. My kids are still in elementary school, so I think if we, there's something we could look at about scaling back those fees as well um, in a slower way, that would be uh, beneficial. Um, but again, to Noelle's point, we'd really have to get into seeing the numbers to really make a best recommendation of what uh, would, would be the best option for that. Um, I did have a couple conversations with Michael Connolly and Scott Buckley about the, the balancing of the budget um, before this meeting, and there's, there's just a lot out there that we have to pay for. And, you know, getting free cash, I know Scott talked a little bit about that, a little bit of free cash coming in from the state for different programs and whatnot that's not going to be here forever. So we do, that's a challenge that the budget does have and the Finance Committee does have that we'd have to work collaboratively together to find an answer for that. Thank you. Okay. Um, following up on uh, Mr. Wellner's uh, point about um, the town budget, so uh, obviously uh, one of the reasons he also mentioned um, the, ba the uh, empty nesters fleeing the town. Um, one of the things that a lot of folks do is they shop for property taxes. Um, our, since I moved here in 2008, my property taxes have gone up like 60% at about, 10, about 5 percent a year every single year. And that, 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 that curve is pretty disturbing, right? And, and, it, and it causes people to wake up and go, I'm out of here as soon as my kids are out of school. So that's, that's, a, that's an issue. Um, the school budget takes up about 70% of the town budget, roughly. It's maybe a little bit higher. Uh, one thing we need to look at is zero-based budgeting. Zero-based budgeting is an annual look at the budget, and it, and it doesn't start with a 25 or 5% increase from last year. Zero-based budgeting says, with the money that we have this year, what do we absolutely need to pay for next year? What I, this town has not ever done that. That's the one thing I would br try to bring to the school committee and the town. The other thing is unfunded liabilities. Um, this town is way underwater in debt, and they don't even know it. Uh, unfunded liabilities are all the outlays for all of your uh, expenditures for all of your retirees going out into the future. I think the school should take a careful look at unfunded liabilities going out to at least 2035 and determine what our budget performance needs to be to meet those numbers. Because I think unfunded liabilities is going to create a debt bubble that someday the people left in this town are going to have to uh, mop up. Last thing I want to talk about is transparency of fees and fundraising expenditures. I will bring transparency of all fee expenditures and transparency of all fundraising expenditures to the parents where it belongs. I have many, many parents who have asked me, I paid 400 for tennis, I got no bus, 
no tennis racket, no t-shirt, no lessons, no nothing, and they pay 400 for football and get buses and everything else. So I want transparency of all fee expenditures and transparency of all fundraising expenditures because the fundraising adds on top of uh, the fees. Thank you. We are all aware of issues under debate across our country, our state, and our town, such as the way we tell our history and the ways we speak about race and human sexuality. While it is not the role of school committee to advise on curriculum, what role does the school committee have in guiding this? I'm writing, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think by writing, if it's not apparent. Um, okay, great, thank you. Um, so what role does the school committee have? Um, well, I think actually um, it, we can start by setting an example um, of, of understanding the importance of a diverse um, community. Um, and also um, to really examine what the, I know you have the, the big rocks that are the, the three big rocks that we have for the, the public school goals and one of them is diversity, equity, inclusion. And so what does that really mean and how can we achieve it? I do hope that as a member of the school committee, I can even if not directly involved in curriculum development, I would very much like to um, have a say on the overall um, goals of a program like that. Um, and we want to create a student body that is not going to um, fear different perspectives, um, that will um, understand a common humanity. Um, I think that students need to see themselves in the curriculum that they um, that they're studying, so doing that through focusing on different experiences, struggles of indi individuals from diverse backgrounds. Um, I do think that there is a lot of great, amazing work being done in this field, and it's something I'm really interested in, actually. Um, and I think that as a school committee member, I would want to help advise to whatever degree I may could to whoever would listen, um, to really choose carefully the curriculum and the values that we're looking for there. Because it can go to one of two ways. I think it can be divisive and I think it can be uniting and I'm for uniting. Um, thanks. So um, I would say that the school committee in so much that it controls the budget, has more control over these things than um, potentially people think that, that they have. Um, you know, when we talk about curriculum and let's say um, diversity of human sexuality, um, that may be the one program that we have that is in the 80s. <laughs> um, and so are we funding, updating that information? Are we getting, are we sending our health teachers to, um, are giving them opportunities to get that sort of training so they understand the, nu the nuances as, you know, this is sort of an area that is changing rapidly and how kids are defining themselves and feeling about themselves. And I think that it's important that the teachers who are educating our kids around these topics, um, that they have the most up-to-date training, that we're giving them the resources that we need, that we're treating this like it's math. And if we don't do well in math, we fix that right away, right? But if we send a kid out of here without you know, a full understanding of human sexuality, we don't um, necessarily, um, that's something that we're, we're not holding ourselves accountable to. And I think that it's important because there are so many kids who are desperately trying to figure out who they are and what, um, how, how they feel about themselves. And we talk about being inclusionary, um, but if we don't give them a safe space to figure that out, not everyone has that in their house. And I think it's important for school committee to make sure that there's a safe place for every kid um, with everything that they're struggling with. Sure. Uh, I, first, I, I 
obviously deeply appreciate the comment that uh, that school committee does not have a direct role in, in curriculum. I obviously fully agree with that. Um, but where school committee does have a, have a role is we hire the superintendent. It's a top-down approach. Think of school committee like a board of directors. We are not designed, nor should we be, in a classroom, but we oversee the superintendent who oversees uh, principals who hire teachers. Obviously, there is a direct connect connection there. Um, so for me, it's holding, it's holding top-down uh, accountability and, and providing the resources they need. To some large degree, we, need to, we school committee need to rely on the people we've hired as experts, as professionals, to do a great job with, with education and to hold them responsible for it. It would be silly for me to go into a classroom and say, now we are teaching fill in the blank, or now we are not teaching fill in the blank. But we also need to hold our, our teachers accountable to make sure they are teaching A to the curriculum, and B, that the curriculum itself, if we're gonna look up and, and look up to, to DESE, you know, it, it's to make sure that this curriculum is right. We do not have a role in creating curriculum. We do not have a role in telling DESE what to do but we need to hold ourselves accountable to those standards. So I, I think teaching, to, uh, teaching diversity is important. I think having a diverse uh, set of educators, providing a, a diverse set of experiences is important, but really it has to come top down and it really has to come from the superintendent without our heavy hand telling exactly what teachers, administrators, uh, what to do. So my, my approach is a little more hands-off, but still no less accountable. This is where I kind of disagree. Um, the school committee members take an oath of office, and I have that oath of office. I, I got it from the town. And the oath of office said that they will uphold the laws of the Commonwealth and the laws of the United States of America. And when Desi pushes down mandates and policies that are not law and that are run counter to the laws of the United States of America, then the, board, the school committee members are not upholding their oaths of office. Okay, so the oath of office is very important and I'll take that very seriously. The law 1532H I mentioned guarantees parents the right to transparency, consent, and choice and to, and to opt out of curriculum that they feel is offensive against their values or counter to the school's role. So long as the school committee takes an oath of office and signs it into the town register, which they do do, they have an oath to uphold the laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the, and the, and the United States. On the, on the topics of race and sex ed, real quick, Martin Luther King said that he dreamed of a day where people were judged not by the color of their skin, but the, by the contact of their character. I grew up in a colorblind home we didn't have race theory, critical race theory, blah, blah, blah theory. My dad's best friend was a black superintendent of the public schools. My brother-in-law is African-American, and we're best buddies. I am not a racist person, never have been a racist person. I don't see color. This constant focus on race in schools teaches children who are colorblind to see color, teaches children to put each other in bins, teaches children that White oppressors or white privilege, have, they have to mask their identity. There's identity masking training in the middle school, by the way. On the sex ed side, they're pushing 16 plus and 18 plus material down to K through five. There are, there are simply materials that are not age appropriate for K through five, and I will fight to prevent these materials from being in our libraries, accessible to middle schoolers. Thank you. Um, so for this question, um, I'm not a licensed educator, um, and I think a school committee's role uh, is not to pick and choose the curriculum in that regard. Um, I would suggest, though, that the committee works with the administration, our teachers, our some support committees on how to bring awareness through clubs, which I know the high school already does, um, perhaps, you know, an, an, younger grades as well, um, maybe bringing in some guest speakers. Uh, we, I think it is important to teach our kids and our students on how to have these harder conversations in a safe environment. 
Um, and then I think the other piece of it is really setting the tone of, of when we're talking about these different types of subjects, having the respect for one another, um, letting know that every student should feel valued being a student here, a teacher, an admin. You know, we all belong to North Reading Public School Systems, and I think that's important. And regardless of what difference we have, we're all still part of that. We're all, we should all be respectful of each other. And if respect isn't there, there should be accountability in that as well. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say on that. Thank you. What will you do to ensure consistency across all schools regarding hiring practices, ongoing training, and education of staff about the complex needs of our students, including special education students and minorities? <laughs> um, so um, that's a great question. Thank you, Buzz. Um, I would say that um, I'm going to piggyback off what Jeff said just a minute ago about um, you know, hiring the superintendent. Um, I think that it should be one of his primary goals um, to create a more diverse, um, you know, set of staff that works in our five schools. Right now, it is, we're one of the worst in Massachusetts in terms of having a diverse um, um, staffing situation. And I think that that is, a really important thing to fix as soon as we possibly can and to put resources in too because there's lots of studies that show that the impact on having one person of color teacher or you know one other marginalized or having marginalized teacher is so impactful to the outcomes of those marginalized students um, in their education it's a really simple thing that we can do that will like greatly improve the outcomes for those kids and to you know, I am a firm believer in the idea that that there are, you know, right now in North Reading, there are, I would be hesitant if I was a really great person of color educator to come work here and have to hold the water of what I hear in our school committee meetings, of what I hear. Um, you know, I think that an important part of being on school committee is standing up for what is right even when it isn't consensus building like that is a huge piece of this right I believe it is right that we fight for our kids to have diverse educators in their lives to have that experience and I hope that I can build consensus on that but I'll fight for it even if it's if, even if I have to do it by myself Excuse me, Rachel, would you remind repeating the question? That was pretty dense. Oh, actually, no, it was, sorry, Wes. No problem. <laughs> what will you do to ensure consistency across all schools regarding hiring practices, ongoing training, and education of staff about the complex needs of our students, including special education students and minorities? Okay, thank you. Um, so that's a dense question, but to, so in, in terms of the hiring um, recruitment strategies. Um, I think, and, and to, to Jody's point, speaking to diversity, um, I have never in all, I have never been part of hiring a superintendent before. I have not been part of that, but I would say continuing to use really creative um, recruitment strategies in order to cast a wide net to really um, attract the best possible, most interesting, and if it happens to be most diverse candidate, then yes. Um, uh, also, just keeping up with um, within the the um, parameters of the budget, making sure we have competitive salaries for teachers. Um, I I'm continually amazed at how incredible um, our our teachers are, and I think that we should want to attract the best, um, and um, that that's an important factor too. Um, in terms of training. Um, I th kind of the same with what I was saying before with the prior answer. Um, I do think that training in terms of working with the um, DEI um, uh, framework or, or requirements, um, I think you can really create a, a wonderful um, humanity-filled environment for both teachers and students when, when training. Um, and then um, finally, um, in terms of the, um, the special education, um, that's an area where I don't have a lot of expertise, but I know people that I could ask. 
And I would like to educate my, myself more on that to, to give you all a really educated answer. But I, I do think that every student, every teacher needs to have the support um, that we can give them. Thank you. Sure. Oh, did, did you say Jeff? Oh, sorry. That's okay. My fault. I, I was just making sure. <laughs> um, Martin Luther King once said, I dream that men will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And I believe in that dream. I believe in the marketplace of the mind. I do not see color, and my children don't see color. And I don't want them learning to see color in the school. I want my physics teacher to love physics and be excited about it. I want my Spanish teacher to be fluent in Spanish and be excited and creative about teaching Spanish to my children. I do not see color, and I don't want our children to see color. This whole topic is an invention of the last 10 years. Please do your, do your research. Martin Luther King is rolling over in his grave. Thank you. Um, it, it's sort of a couple of questions rolled into into one. It's it's how do we how do we deal with hiring practices, as well as uh, remain consistent across our schools. Uh, to the first point, to me, I, I guess I give the very practical answer of let's make our schools the most attractive places we can. Let's make sure our schools are somewhere where everyone wants to be. Um, certainly, from an educators an educator's perspective. Um, that attracts the best talent. Uh, I know it's naive to think that that alone will do it, but, but part of it is making sure, as, as was mentioned, uh, that we are competitive in our pay, that we do have a, a, good, a good employment package that we can offer, but it's also incumbent on us to, to set a good example. Um, you know, we, we do have the hiring capability of the superintendent. Uh, that is not a knock on Dr. Daly whatsoever. Uh, is just to say, you know, we have expectations about what we want our uh, our staff to to do and and how we want them to perform. To me, there's an expectation level to that, as I mentioned earlier. Um, in terms of of consistency, uh, again, that sort of comes top down. That's good management practice. From from my perspective, that is an efficiency and a management practice that just has to be bred top down. Uh, if you want to have a good school system through your whole entire town, you demand that. You say that you, having one school, if you're seeing numbers lower at one school than another, then clearly something is, is lacking. You look at the numbers and you take action as needed. So to me, it's, it's more a matter of looking at the metrics and saying, where are we under or overperforming? Let's emulate the overperforming and, and help the underperforming and make sure you look across the board to have that consistency. Um, great, great question, thank you. Okay, so I think recruiting, just like uh, Jeff had just said, should be the same and consistent across all five schools. Um, I think it's incredibly important to have appropriate number of staff and qualified staff. Um, there should be support, trainings for um, the teachers to know how to interact and teach children that might have different learning styles or learning abilities. Um, the RISE program is intertwined in our schools, in some of our schools, in the Little and the Hoods specifically, um, ensuring that all of our teachers that are in those schools have you know, the trainings and the support to accommodate those children as well is very important. Uh, I think you know, communication is key also for between you know, the superintendent, the principals, the administration, the teachers, and the parents you know, all of that needs to be in lineup because um, that, you know, that plays into the accountability piece of it and making sure um, our children are getting the best education that they can. Uh, and yeah, it's basically just supporting trainings uh, with the different learning abil abilities. Thank you. We have been fortunate 
fortunate enough to have Dr. Daly with us these past two years and note that the current school committee has unanimously voted to extend his contract until June 30th, 2026. In the unlikely event that we would need to find a new superintendent, what are the qualities that you would look for in the next candidate? Thank you. Um, okay, well, I certainly hope that that's not the case. Um, I would say I would want to look for someone who, um, who has a lot of the characteristics that Dr. Daly has. Um, I have been continually impressed by him over the past few years, um, under, under fire, under pressure with everything that's happened with COVID. It's been, it's been great. He's clearly a very, very good listener. Um, and uh, tries, um, so I'll, leave, I'll, I'll shift from describing Dr. Daly to describing a, a mystery candidate. Um, someone who's a good listener, someone who listens to all perspectives, um, all, um, whether it be families, um, in different people in administration, teachers, um, someone who um, is fair, um, someone who has the ability to bring people together, um, and build relationships even when things are difficult. Um, obviously, um, having a, a really strong background in education, um, I think we have to remember that's why we're all here. So someone who has a strong foundation in classical education. We have been talking about a lot of issues tonight, but we haven't talked about math. We haven't talked about STEM and things like that. So I wanna make sure someone is a, is a very experienced, creative educator um, and and always willing to look at new ways to to learn um, or to, to to teach kids. Um, I would also say someone who is budget minded. Um, and finally, again, I just think that um, it's it's a position. It's an administrative position, but it, it it's it's a guiding position. Being someone that people can look up to and go to for um, for support and advice um, is really important. So. Thank you. Okay. I think Dr. Daly is doing a great job. I hope that's not the case as well. Um, what I look for in a uh, superintendent for us would be, you know, a, a strong leader, someone that shows up. Um, Dr. Daly has done that all through the pandemic, which I think is admirable be you know, visible, good listening, open-minded, um, knowledgeable, um, have a passion for being around kids and, and being in the education field. I think that's important um, as well. And, and backing on Noel, like someone that, you know, the children, the students, the teachers that, you know, want to look up to um, and look to him for direction when things are going great and also when things aren't going so great. Thank you. Sure. Um, uh, along with the, the empathetic qualities that, that any educator or any administrator in a school system need, for me, I would want to see where they're planning on going. What is your three to five year plan? Um, as we've learned the hard way, um, having a plan is, is not always perfect. Things are going to go their own way. Um, but having a plan to see where their objectives are, I mean, it answers a lot of the questions that have come up in terms of what are your priorities? How do you deal with things like diversity? Understanding where that person plans on taking us for the next three to five years really is to me part, part and parcel of, of the position. Uh, if I'll indulge in making a sports analogy, uh, you don't pass the ball to where the player is, you pass, them to, you pass the ball to where they're gonna be. That's what I would look for in, in, a, in a candidate. Um, so that could be anything from diversity and inclusion. It could be where they, where they see extracurricular activities, where they want to put their focus. And again, that then speaks back to collaboration with school committee and school committee to, to uh, other town committees to then say, well, where do we put our focus for budget? That's how that collaborative process works. And it starts with understanding a longer term plan. So, so to me, that's, that's the biggest characteristic of a, of a candidate. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, going back over a decade, many, many parents um, have talked to me over a decade long and have expressed many concerns about Common Core, which has been a disaster for this state. Our state standards were here in 2009. Michigan picked them up and we took Common Core and our state standards dropped. So Common Core was a big one. Um, pushing age inappropriate material to middle schoolers and, and K through five. And, and of course, an overemphasis on CRT and SEL and, and um, CSC to the exclusion of or to the detriment to STEM languages, arts, and their primary subjects. Many, many parents that I know personally have, have expressed these concerns to the school committee and to Dr. Daly, and they have been ignored. These concerns go right to the heart of public law 20 U.S. Code 1532H, which guarantees parents the right to transparency, consent, and choice when it comes to the curriculum. Until that law stops being violated by this school system in deference to DESE, the school committee answers to DESE alone. And also, if you agree with all of this CRT stuff, then you have the perfect ear of, and, and Daly's the best guy on the planet, and so was Bernard before him. If you disagree, you get ignored and shut out and watch the school committee videos and watch how, how many times the parents have been engaged in between the meetings. No, one, no, no one's ever called me to want to discuss our issues. These are, if you disagree with this CRT, SEL, um, CSE stuff, you get shut out and ignored and that has to stop. So I would hire a superintendent that focuses on STEM languages, the arts, as primary focus of the school, excellence in STEM languages and the arts and civics. And I would also have a, a, a superintendent that brings before the school committee issues raised by many parents for discussion. This is, a one, this is always a one-way street. We, we, we com communicate and then nothing happens. And then I would bring one that was highly qualified to uphold the laws of the Commonwealth and the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I would say um, that um, if I get to pick an ideal candidate, I would really love a kid, a, us to have um, someone from a marginalized community, from, um, from an outside, um, you know, North Reading is doing an amazing job and I, um, and I think we have some great administrators, but we really like to promote from within. And I think that um, it, we could really use some outside people to, um, to bring fresh perspectives. Um, I do not believe that North Reading does everything the best that any school system is capable of doing it. They do a lot of things well, but it doesn't mean that no one could bring anything to the table that, um, that we wouldn't benefit from. I think it would be um, important for someone who has strong convictions. I think that I need to be able to trust that our superintendent, or as a parent, as a school committee member, I want to be able to trust that our superintendent is advocating for what is best for our kids, regardless of what other people are saying to him or calling to him. Um, or her or them, um, sorry. Uh, but I think that it's important that they, because I am never gonna be as knowledgeable on education as our superintendent is, so I need to be able to look at them and know that even if he is, has an unpopular opinion or she has uh, disagrees with me or is gonna say something different than I am, um, then that she's still gonna say it. And I just wanna say for the record that, um, that having worked with Dr. Daly, I have a lot of wonderful things to say about him, but we have disagreed before and he has always continued to speak to me. So I think that he does have that quality and I'd continue to look for that quality in a superintendent. Per the North Reading Public Schools non-discrimination and harassment policy, the North Reading Public Schools do not tolerate discrimination against students, parents, employees, or the general public on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, pregnancy or pregnancy status, disability, homelessness, religion, age, or immigration status. If elected, do you agree with this statement and do you promise to uphold it to the letter? Yes or no? Ooh. But I have so many things to say. <laughs> we, 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Rach. <laughs> we could probably go down the line on that one. We could go down the line on this one. <laughs> we could just go down the line on It's a lightning one. round. Sure, he, uh, absolutely, yes. Jody. Yes. Yes. John. Unequivocally, yes. John. Yes. <laughs> it's unanimous. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for all your thoughtful answers and for your willingness to serve and make a difference in the community. You are now invited to present your closing statement of up to one minute, again, done in random order. Or we can yeah, go on the line in this one. This is, yeah. If you still have a basket. We have time for you to do two minutes. I'm fine with that. Well, you talk in a minute. Oh, you guys talk for two minutes in the beginning. Yeah, so. I, yeah I, heard, be I got two minutes in the email. My email said opening two minutes <laughs> and closing Noelle. one. Noelle? I am like, I should go to Kitty's and play some Kino after this. I am pulling. Okay. Um, okay, everyone, thank you again for your time tonight. Um, I know everyone out there is listening tonight, um, listening with bated breath because they care deeply about education in North Reading, and uh, I assure you that's why I'm here as well. Um, just to summarize why I think I will be a valuable addition to the school committee. Um, I'm a collaborator and a bridge builder um, by nature and by training. Uh, I am very good at listening to people voice their opinions and concerns with empathy and um, helping to move parties towards logical and fact-based decisions. Uh, I operate from a neutral middle ground and I would like to think of myself as very diplomatic. Uh, I believe in engaging all stakeholders, students, families, teachers, administration. Uh, I have experience um, in my grants management work with creatively allocating budgets and using limited funds to get projects done. Uh, as I mentioned before, I would like to assist our children as they move on and recover academically, physically, and psychologically from the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I'm also very passionate and committed to strict academic standards, merit-based achievement, healthy discourse and debate. Uh, I, as I mentioned before as well, I believe in a strong classic foundation to education, including literature, science, history, civics, critical thinking. Um, I would like to foster an environment of resilience and possibility in our schools. Um, and finally, I believe in a unifying approach that will help build a common culture in which all students are seen as both unique people and as belonging to and an essential member of the student body at large. So thank you for your time and consideration. First, thank you very much to the students, um, the transcript and North, NORCAM for putting this all together. Uh, Bob, Rachel, Ruth, and of course the candidates for taking their time out. Uh, this, was, this was very valuable, and um, I think we, we saw some very diverse opinions, and I hope you include my opinion among your opinions to be inclusive. Thank you very much. Um, if you haven't watched Mrs. Doris DePatty from last Monday's school committee meeting, please go to YouTube and go to the NORCAM channel and, and t type in, uh, I think it's North Reading Public School from Monday, this past Monday, and watch her several minute speech. Um, I, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's about two or three minutes, and um, she is an African American woman, and she's married to Drew DePatty, and she called at that meeting for an immediate end to the anti-racism pledge, or whatever that thing was that the school passed in July 2021. That pledge, or whatever that's called, is teaching our kids to see color first to see victims first, to see oppressors first. And this, this, this person very eloquently told the school that she wants that pledge to be erased from the history books of this school. I am here because I want transparency, consent, and choice per public law, 20 U.S. Code 1538. Why this, why following the public law is controversial, I have no idea. Somebody please explain to me why following 20 U.S. Code 1538's giving parents their lawful rights to transparency in the libraries, transparency curriculum, and the, opt the option to opt out of CRT, SEL, and CSC training is controversial. I don't understand that, but that's what I'm here for. Thank you.
Sure. First off, thank you to everybody who, who put on this great event. Um, thank you to the students. I would never have had the, uh, the fortitude to do that when I was in, in school. So my hat's off to you. Uh, and thank you to the candidates. It, it does take a lot of passion. It does take a lot of, uh, a, a lot of resiliency to, to do this sort of thing. So I, I appreciate what, uh, what all the candidates bring. Um, I will say, from my perspective, there is a job to do here. It is not an easy job. It is, it is something that is a necessity for any town. Um, it is something that has several tenants to it. Budget we've talked about, superintendent. We listen to uh, the students and teachers present the great work they've been doing, and they do it all the time. For me, those are the basic things, but to get that work done means a lot of collaboration. As, as Noel was saying, and I, I fully agree, um, it, it requires the collaboration of the select board, finance, superintendents, uh, NREA. In two years, uh, two to three years, uh, I don't remember the exact date, uh, this board, the, the people elected here will be negotiating or working on the negotiation for the next contract for our school system. That is over 80% of the budget. Um, our job is to do our job. Elections in large part are about identity. Not our identity, that has nothing to do with us. It has to do with how we project the town's identity. For us to do our job is to, to present that identity. It is to get our job done. Our kids are gonna be hornets for the rest of their lives. If we want them to have the pride in being hornets, then it is incumbent on, on us to do a great job of being on the school committee. So thank you all very much for your time. Thank you again to everyone who is here and online at home. I want our schools to continue to be a safe and nurturing place where students can respect one another and become strong, independent, critical thinkers. My focus is on student achievement and accountability while promoting a collaborative learning environment that motivates and encourages our students to work together to ensure success for all. If elected, I would work towards helping move our school district forward from the pandemic's impacts, addressing our children's mental health and their learning gaps. I believe visiting school, our schools would provide beneficial information and talking with staff and students about what is working and what could be improved. I am a highly self-motivated individual who continues to work through challenges until there is a resolution. I would use good judgment in allocating and reallocating fiscal resources within the budget to ensure appropriate class sizes are kept throughout all five of our schools. We need to enrich opportunities for building cognitive and social interactions through extracurricular activities such as clubs and sports teams to help children develop motor skills and enhance their sense of well-being. It is also important to provide professional development and training to support our teachers so they can do what they do best. I have been involved with the Little School PTO since my oldest started kindergarten. I am the treasurer on their board and I am committed to accuracy, transparency, and timeliness to maintain the finances and set the budget. In this role, I have enjoyed meeting and helping students, teachers, and families in our district have the best experiences here. I wanna bring this passion to our entire student body at North Reading Public Schools. I will invest my time toward the continued success of the school committee to build a strong learning foundation for our children to become successful in their adult life. A quote that embodies my values by Kofi Annan, knowledge is power, information is liberating, education is the premise of progress in every society and every family. I truly believe I am the best candidate for an open seat and I hope you vote for me on May 3rd. Thank you. Thanks. Um, again, thank you to everyone um, for doing this. Um, I, I wanna start by saying the first line of the mission statement of the North Reading Public Schools is that it will provide a safe and supportive environment for learning. Um, I'm paraphrasing, so don't quote me on that. Um, but it does say safe and supportive. And I think, um, what I really want to focus on is right now after this debate is, or not debate, sorry, forum, <laughs> um, after this forum is saying to all the families out there that are watching, all the kids, the people who will watch it tomorrow or later because right now they're putting their kids to bed is the same thing that I say to my kids, which is only you get to decide who you are. 
right? If you see yourself as a person of color, if you see yourself as a marginalized person, if you see yourself as a member of the LGBT community, you get to say that and you get to be proud of it. And that's what I want for our schools. Um, I could talk about a million things, all the things that I have done in North Reading, all the work that I've done in our schools, um, working with music boosters, working with the Safe Schools program, but really what it comes down to is I wanna create a space where nobody tells you who you are and that you are valued and appreciated for who you are. And I think that I want that for myself as well when we talk about what the role of the school committee is, is to say, I get to decide for me, yes, there's pieces of it that are a job, but I get to decide to, for me, myself what those priorities are for me. And what I wanna do is be a space where any person can come to me and say, this is what's hard for me. And it may not, helping them may not do the greatest good, but it will do immeasurable good for that one person. And I think that that's just as valuable as doing the most good for the most people. So thank you, and I would like to ask you to vote for me on May 3rd. Thank you. <laughs> this brings us to the end of our candidates forum. Thank you to all the candidates who participated for being great role models for civic dialogue and for proving it's still possible in this day and age. Thank you to the students of North Reading High School. With engaged voters like this, the future looks bright indeed. Thank you to the transcript for sponsoring, North Camp for broadcasting, and the volunteers for their many hours of work behind the scenes. Please remember to vote on May 3rd. Again, the registration deadline is tonight at midnight. People are dying every day in Ukraine to protect their freedoms, including the right to vote. Let's make sure we exercise our rights here in North Reading. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Okay.